This is Patriots Draft Countdown, presented by Bud Light. Welcome to the NFL Draft. Hosted by the writers of Patriots.com. From now until you hear the New England Patriots like the countdown is on. Welcome to the Patriots Draft Countdown, presented by Bud Light. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Patriots Draft Countdown brought to you by Bud Light. Easy to drink, easy to enjoy. Bud Light, the official beer sponsor of the New England Patriots. And guys, we're just about two weeks to go here. We're we're getting a little redundant on the the, the quarterback of it all, I feel like. Uh, Those guys have been in for visits, so we're just going to catch you guys up quick here in the first segment on some latest news. And I guess top of the list is Kyle Duggar signing an extension. Not sure how much that really affects the draft, Paul. I think we all still kind of feel like they could maybe use a free safety, but but maybe a little bit. Yeah, I, I'm not sure it's a, a huge um, impact on the draft either, but it is, I think, a good sign because I, and I talked about this a lot during the season last year, and clearly they thought it was important to maintain you know as much of that continuity as they could, but I thought Duggar in particular was one of those guys that had sort of you, you drafted and developed second round pick had some success made some plays had a really strong 22 season um maybe didn't have uh, as many flashy plays um last year as he did but i thought it was a, a good message to sort of send to not just maintain you know that guy on the roster but to say we understand you know how you guys think in there and this is what we want to do we want to reward you for being on board and being a big part of our team it's not like an achievement award or anything the guy's a good player so i thought that was a you know a good sign good good all around i thought it was good for kyle duggar but also a good message to send in the locker room yeah and you hear some reports out there that he was pretty unhappy about the transition tag and getting that placed on him so just in terms of his happiness or his his, uh, willingness or want to to be here I think it's a good thing to get this extension done. Sounded like it, it came to bre- together pretty quickly over the last week or so with OTAs and the spring program starting for the Patriots. But go back to the free safety thing real quick. I, I do think that, that it continues to be a need. I just don't love him playing up top like that, like he's Devin McCourty. I just don't really think that that fits his style. I don't really think it fits your guy Jabril Peppers' style either. So it's not necessarily that they need to bring in somebody that's going to play 85 90% of the snaps, but can you get a Deron Harmon type in the third or fourth round that on third down and obvious passing situations, that's the player that plays the post safety role in the man coverage schemes. And you allow Duggar and peppers to be closer to the ball last year, career high in free safety snaps for Kyle Duggar. Uh, Paul mentioned, maybe not as many splash plays on the ball. I think a big reason why that was is because he's so far away from the ball. You know, if you're all constantly 30 yards off the line of scrimmage, uh, you're not going to be near the ball as often as when you're playing in the box. So I think that that remains a need. Maybe not one that they can use a high pick on this year, uh, but someone in that third or fourth round range. And there's a few guys that fit that mold in this year's draft. It almost makes me think a little bit of Eugene Wilson. Remember, I mean, he was kind of a cornerback coming out, right? And then oh, yeah. when Malloy went, he just kind of got thrust into that free safety role a little bit. There, yeah, uh, back I mean, we in could 03. go into a whole uh, side story about that. It was Antoine Harris and, and Rodney Harrison at safety in week one. And um, you guys might recall they lost 31 to nothing. In week two, it was Eugene Wilson <laughs> moving to, to safety and. The rest was history, as they say. All right, well, we've been talking a lot about Drake May, J.J. JJ McCarthy, Jaden Daniels. They're all blended together. We know uh, reports last week that all three of those guys are coming in. I think May was here earlier, la- uh, late last week. Daniels, I think, was here today, and, and yeah. McCarthy's coming. So, guys, it continues to be kind of jockeying between those positions, T. I mean, it's kind of getting – I think we're getting a little <laughs> worn out, you know, especially with the third overall pick as Evan did his rant about mock drafts. There's just not a, really a lot to consider other than, I mean, for me, where I'm at – Take May if he's there, otherwise trade down. I'm a little bit sour on Daniels, but I'd still be open to taking him. But but what do you think Patriots bringing these guys uh, in clearly have interest in I him. think you got to get a quarterback. Um, it kind of goes back. Evan said it before that Christmas game might come back to bite you in the butt. But, um, I mean, you want to take May, but then I think Daniels is the second best option. I'm not as sold on McCarthy, but I hope it's May or Daniels, so we'll see in April. Yeah, I think what's interesting about the visits and really this entire pre-draft process has been a three-horse race for the Patriots and Michael Penix, Bo Nix, Spencer Rattler need not apply, right? Like they're not even in the conversation. And I think it does tell you a lot about what their thought process is at their, the number 30 overall pick and where they feel like they're going to take a quarterback in this draft. It just based off of everything that they've done, unless this is the smoke screen of all smoke screens, which I, know. <laughs> I don't really understand why they would, you know, we can get into that, I guess, later, but... I, they are honing in on these three guys. These are the three guys that they've sent continues to to their pro days that they've had in for 30 visits. 
it just doesn't seem like they have any interest in the second tier or third tier quarterbacks in this draft. It's all about those three guys at the top. So I don't necessarily take away much about, oh, they're more interested in this guy, that guy quite yet. Uh, but I feel like in terms of the tiers of quarterbacks, they are honed in on those top three guys. Yeah, what do you think, Paul, those guys? I mean, it's it just kind of gotten to this Everything point Evan now. just said, yeah. I totally agree with it. You know, and Michael Penix is the only other one of those guys that I even have a little interest in. Mm -hmm. And I just can't come up with any rational explanation as to why they've done so little in terms of personal interaction with him yeah. if they were interested in him so I got to think it's it's down to those other three and I think it's really you know I, I think it's between McCarthy and and uh and May because I think they feel like Daniels is going to go to Washington so I'm kind of like Tease. I'm, I'm not really sold on McCarthy, so to me, I've yeah. I've wrapped my my mind around Drake May. You don't go four and thirteen to pick JJ McCarthy. That's what I'll say. But uh, <laughs> it's a fair point. That's the thing that I've always said about JJ McCarthy. That's given me pause about it. Is I just don't see game changing talent on film. I don't see a guy that's going to come in here and be your franchise savior. And I'd hate to put that on any of these guys. But at least with Jaden Daniels, obviously with the Heisman Trophy season, you can see that on film of this guy can be an absolute game changer drake may with the physical tools absolute game changer you know mvp caliber type traits i what are jj mccarthy's traits in that category i'm just not really necessarily sure i, I think that he's a great quarterback that for a, a lot of different teams i just don't feel like the patriots are one of those teams all right well you heard evan mention Jaden daniels we got a packed show we're gonna go right now to evan's film review of Jaden daniels you also talked to Derek klassen yes. uh, a little bit about the quarterback so it is still a quarterback jam show and we'll finish it off, though, talking with the position groups everybody loves. Wide receiver, tight end, running back. So jam-packed show. Check it all out. First up, though, Evan's film review of Jaden Daniels. Hello, everybody. Welcome into a very special Patriots Countdown film room edition. Today we are going to break down Jaden Daniels, the LSU quarterback, potential target for the Patriots at three overall. Now, as we get into the film here, I want to talk about Jaden Daniels as a passer. I think all of us know what he brings to the table as a runner, one of the most dynamic runners in college football in his Heisman Trophy winning season, but what can he do from the pocket? So as we roll this play a little bit, you're gonna see LSU get into this trips formation. If we pause it right here, you can see these two receivers right here in the number three spot, that's Malik Neighbors. The number two spot, that's Brian Thomas Jr. We all know about those guys as well. This is a staple concept for LSU. They're gonna run a crossing route here over the middle of the field with Neighbors. Brian Thomas is gonna run the slot fade, one of Jaden Daniels' favorite routes to throw. And what he's going to read is this post safety there in the middle of the field. If that post safety jumps this crossing route, he's gonna to get to the one-on-one -on -one to Brian Thomas on the slot fade and vice versa. If the safety helps over the top of the slot fade, it's to the crossing route. So as we roll the play a little bit more, you can see the numbers go here into the middle of the field. It gives that one-on-one -on -one to Brian Thomas Jr. over the top and watch this throw right on a dime by Jaden Daniels. That's the money throw for him. Those slot fade routes, you get into those one-on-ones down the field and he can drop it right in the bucket. This next play here, what I love so much about this one from Daniels is that he stands in the pocket and he takes a big hit. This is the toughness that a lot of people talk about with this quarterback class from the pocket. So again, you got neighbors here, the bottom of the screen, he's gonna run what's called a glance route, a little skinny post there, and they're gonna blitz here from the inside at the linebacker position, and that's going to create a free runner to the quarterback. And watch this anticipation and put the ball where the blitz is coming from. That's what you want to do as the quarterback. You see him layer that throw in the middle of the field, hit uh, neighbors there in stride, and watch the yak take advantage of those yards after the catch, one of the fastest receivers in college football. The other thing I want to express that Jaden Daniels does at a really high level is full field progressions. This is a quarterback that can go all the way from first read to check down on this particular play. They're running a staple for LSU here at the top of the screen. If we roll it a little bit more, we can see these routes develop. This is a smash fade concept here at the top. So you're gonna have the hitch from the outside receiver, then you're gonna have the fade route from the inside receiver there. And as we roll just a second longer, you can stop it right there. You see the hitch route here at the top of the screen and you see the fade route. The defense has three over two here at the top of the screen. So that's covered and Jaden Daniels recognizes that and he's gonna get to this backside dig route. And one of the things I write so much about this play is that he started in his drop by looking over here on the left side and then the throwing hallway transitions to the middle of the field, gets his eyes, hips, 
feet all pointed towards this dig side, this dig route here on the backside, throws it right in stride, can pick up some yards after the catch. That's a full field progression from Jaden Daniels. That's all over his film at LSU. So a couple of positives to also talk about here. Obviously the running ability, you can turn on the highlights on YouTube and see that. He's one of the most dynamic runners I've seen come out of college since Lamar Jackson. But on the other side of things, we do have to talk about this number right here. And 210s, that's, if he weighs in at 210 at LSU's Pro Day, he's going to be just okay. Some people think that he's closer to 195, 200. We'll see. That number is going to be a big number for Jaden Daniels. He has a wiry frame. Six foot four is good height, but he's very wiry. He's very lean. That's going to be a question mark of whether or not he can hand up, handle NFL contact. The last thing I would say about him, he lives a lot on the boundaries. A lot of those fade routes like the first play that we showed you, that's a big part of his production at LSU last year in his Heisman season. Can he hit those layered throws in the middle of the field more consistently? Because that's the NFL game. You're not going to have Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr. with you next year. Can you hit some more of those layups in the middle of the field and take a fewer hits as a smaller guy in the pocket and outside the pocket as well. Jaden Daniels, though, ton of talent. Love him for everybody. Love him for the Patriots. They're at number three overall. All right, folks, it's maybe the episode you've been waiting for. We still got quarterbacks to do, but, but today we're going to rifle through running backs, tight ends, and yes, wide receivers, all positions of need for the Patriots. Maybe tight ends a little bit less so after signing Austin Hooper and Hunter Henry there at that position. But let's start off with running back guys in this position. Start with you, Evan, that, you know, it's kind of been devalued a little bit, and I don't think there's really a high end, uh, you know, number one kind of guy. But there are a number of later round guys. Why don't you give us, though, some of the top round guys that maybe 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 a little bit too soon for the Patriots? Yeah, so this is not a particularly strong running back class at the top. Like you said, there's no Christian McCaffrey. There's no Saquon Barkley. There's not even a Jameer Gibbs in this class. <laughs> this is uh, or Bijan or one of those guys. Uh, this is a day two and three running back class. Um, I think the number one running back consensus for the most part is Blake Corum from Michigan. Uh, you also hear a lot of Benson from Florida State as well. He's up there too. Uh, but those two guys that are really the start I would say uh, probably in the third round May maybe one of those guys sneaks into the back of the second round just because somebody wants to jump ahead and, and pick one earlier uh, than everybody else will but at some point in this draft there will be a run of a run of running backs <laughs> that will all come off the board and those guys can all be a part of a committee and be you know useful players at the NFL level they're not again they're not going to be bell cows they're not going to be uh the that stud running back uh but if you're talking about getting a, a tag partner for Ramondre Stevenson you know those exist in this draft in droves like there's a lot of those guys but none of them really are looked at as like difference makers or game changers what do you got Paulie any, any of these guys strike your fancy yeah at all? I mean obviously I like Coram a lot but um I agree with Evan in terms of you know where does it make sense for the Patriots I also like the Jonathan Brooks a little bit although kind of one year of production so maybe some question marks there there are guys that were lead backs there were guys that you know that certainly carried the load but I think you know like Corum's a guy that you look at him you're like oh he must be a passing back because he's not very big but he is that kind of a lead guy and I like the way Evan talked about it a tag team guy for Ramondre Stevenson I just don't think you can afford to do it I think you're going to be looking at day three guys um and I'm not even sure that you have enough room for, for that. I, I think that that's a, it's a spot. Like, you can't fill everything in one draft, and I'm not sure running back uh, meets the, the threshold here. Uh, there are some guys that can play, and I, and I would add, you know, Benson as well with Florida State that Evan mentioned. I, I, I do like the, some of these players. I think there's some skill. Not enough, really, for the Patriots to think about him in day two. Yeah, so as we get into day two, day three, T's, any of those guys I, kind of stand out to I you? I think Coram's a day two, day three guy. He kind of reminds me of Philip Lindsay. Just very downhill. Also catch the ball. That's, that's one of the comps over Com there. Nice. Philip Lindsay. Com not bad. Five eight. You know. Yeah. No. Um, Made I, a Pro Bowl. Yeah. No. Yeah. But fifty eight rushing touchdown or touchdowns at Michigan. You can't ignore that. Um, can do a bit of everything. So that's kind of the sweet spot where I'd take a running back. Other than that, if you're the Patriots, you're looking sixth, seventh round, hopefully, and maybe undrafted free agent. For yeah. That. We were uh, we were into Bucky Irving. We were, we were at the combine. Such we were talking Bucky combine. Irving, and then. He kind of had a terrible combine, but historically him, bad. Like his, you know, he looked explosive in the games, yeah. but we got there in the testing numbers, not so much. Yeah. So Bucky Irving's an interesting guy, and you know some some of these other guys too, like Tyrone Tracy Jr. from Purdue or Dylan Lobby, the local kid from UNH. Those guys are all interesting. I just feel like 
when they sign Antonio Gibson, those guys are more of those sub package pass catching backs, yeah. probably not what they're looking for. Now they're probably looking for somebody in that early down role, Ramondre, Damian Harris, like that sort of running back, uh, which there are some options to my, my favorite running back in this entire class is Marshawn Lloyd from USC. Uh, I just think that he's got the ability uh, to run between the tackles and catch the ball out of the backfield. Great senior bowl week, but he's also like a vertical threat in the passing game too. seems, you know, run the, uh, run the wheel route, you know, that sort of thing. Give me the route tree. Yeah, yeah, just uh, (laughs) definitely one of those backs that can do a bit of everything. And the way that he runs does remind me a little bit of Ramondre, where he's a bigger back, but he has that ability to move laterally and make guys miss and uh, find the right holes and things like that. So uh, he's probably an early day three guy, I would say, maybe end of round three, uh, early round four. Um, But, you know, that's probably where I start of even thinking is that fourth round pick. I've kind of pegged it as a tight end spot but maybe they think of it as more of a running back spot. Yeah, Braylon Allen from Wisconsin was once another one. Yep. giant dude. I mean, he's, like, fun to watch. Maybe not not Derrick Henry, but, like, kind of similar size. I got a late-round guy. I love the NFL bloodlines. Paul, we talked about this in the last episode, but Frank Gore Jr. All right, guy, <laughs> guy I love Frank Gore Jr. <laughs> Can handle the workload, and that's, like, you know, potential sixth, seventh-round guy, maybe UDFA. So, yeah. So, Will Shipley is a guy that I've always kind of watched at Clemson. Um pretty productive i get a little worried about guys that have that m- much wear and tear uh, before they even get into the league but pretty productive guy i, I agree again with with both tease and, and evan i i don't think there's that star power uh in this group so it's going to be your flavor your particular liking you're going to take someone in round five or something and you're going to hope that maybe he's better than kevin harris and maybe right. he can earn a, a roster spot um will shipley's a guy i thought that had some versatility you know a lot of production in the ACC. I know people don't think of that as as strong as as other conferences, but I, I think he has some ability too. Um, and Irving, your guy, because you guys had me Bucky. on Bucky Irving too. So I watched him. Man, you know, and Evans again, right about Gibson probably mitigates that need, but he struggles in in pass yeah. protection. Yeah. I don't think that's uh, he's smaller. That that was not a third down back that you uh, necessarily would clamor to. Yeah, he, he's a smaller guy. I think what the hope was was that he he does show a lot of explosiveness on tape, and that t- that did not translate to the combine. Now historically speaking running backs it's not a big combine position because so much of it is how you carry the ball in pads and how you break tackles and stuff like that so it's not really a big combine position but Bucky Irving's one of those guys I think his RAS was like 1.9 out of 10 or like it was it was a bomb you know it was a very very bad combine all right, Sorry, well, Bucky uh, Irving. <laughs> I like you a lot. <laughs> so let's let's then uh, let's move on to tight ends, and I mean, I'd say it's kind of a similar class, maybe. I mean, you have Jatavian Sanders probably at the top, but otherwise, you're really looking at like day uh, two, Brock day Bowers? three kind of guy. Oh, sorry. Well, <laughs> I, like, I, I just like, see, I just I, completely I know I don't know as no. distracted as deeply as you guys do. No, but. you know what? It, you know what the problem with Brock Bowers is? I just I ignore you him eliminate because him. I'm like I'm like I can't even think about him. Yeah. Don't even get excited about him um, because there's plenty of reasons, obviously, to get excited about Brock Bowers. So, Tease, why don't you give us a little uh, Brock Bowers? I mean, he's been doing it for a while is he a senior junior senior junior junior he he did in the in the one of the finals he went off so i wasn't really focusing too much on the top guys because as a fan i'm a little worried if they pick a tight end above the fourth <laughs> right. so, so i'll I'll, like, ah. I'll go down to some of the lower round guys we we talked yeah. with sanat and um at the combine but also i said it in the intro episode dallin holker from colorado state just one of those receiving tight ends he can yeah. break loose good hands has really some athletic. speed for being a big guy so that's one of the guys i'd like to see the pats maybe snag later yeah. in the draft yeah so not all over the place right like everybody's yeah. got him i mean i saw phil perry i mean he just seems like he's kind of that sweet spot of like a fourth round kind of guy really athletic um you know maybe needs to you know work on blocking that who, who, who doesn't really at this level but um, he's a favorite, though. I got a red flag on him. He's a, he's a tight end out of Iowa <laughs> who went to Kansas State, not <laughs> Iowa. What, what was wrong with him? And he played hockey. He played hockey. Hockey. Because <laughs> Iowa's the, the tight end factory. Wait, 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 why didn't right. he go there? Uh, well, there's a guy named Eric All who's also in this class. He plays at Iowa. Uh, but I'm just going to come out and say this tight end class stinks. It's awful. <laughs> okay? I, I'm just going to be honest with you. Sorry, Claire. Uh, especially coming off of the tight end class last year and how stacked that group was. Yeah. This group is Brock Bauer. Hours, gap, Jatavian Sanders, gap, people that might make an NFL roster. But, but that, let, that's this class. Let's yeah. talk about like some of the best NFL tight ends are drafted in the mid round. So who knows? Oh, might, it's might crap, Tease. <laughs> it's crap. With that being said, Kate Stover. 
Cade Stover. Anything? So yep. Cade Stover is a converted like defensive a end, yeah. which I like. Pass rusher, yeah. right? Even. Because he's got he's got some <laughs> some nastiness to him, yeah. you know, because he does come from that defensive background. So if you want a guy that can put his hand in the dirt and block some people, Cade Stover can do it. He's just not a dynamic receiver, right? And he'll take some time. And the fact that you have Henry and Hooper, two veterans in front of him, would give you some time. But again, this is a day three guy. This is you're yeah. not you, you're just not in a position where you. It's not a, a luxury. That'd be a luxury pick to take a guy and not expect anything out. Yeah, of. I think the one guy that I would probably sit, put in that category of let's take this guy as a flyer is Theo Johnson from Penn State because of how good he was at the combine. He's 6'6", 255. He is the second most athletic combine tester at the tight end position ever. In 30 years of the combine, nobody has tested better than him I think, except one guy, I think it was Vernon Davis, who tested ridiculous. Uh, so he's – that ball of clay of just pure athleticism didn't have a ton of production at Penn state in the receiving game, passing game. Uh, but if you're looking for the untapped potential high upside, that sort of guy, I would say Theo Johnson, I've, I've liked Ben Sinnott throughout the entire process. So I'm, I'm in on him as well. Uh, but in terms of this tight end class, uh, there's just, it's just not exciting. There's no. just not much there. And uh, I think for a team like the Patriots that, you really have so many holes to burn a pick in the top 100 or the top 125 even on one of these tight ends. It's going to have to be the right guy. Like yeah. It's going to have to be a guy that you really like. I just throw Jared Wiley in there from TCU too. Oh, just yeah. as if you want like a third tight end, like a big block, I mean, he's like a 6'6", 270. I mean, he's going to be that third guy, which I mean could be a role, but again, do you really need to draft that? They have so many other needs. So, Without further ado, though, we're going to get right to the wide receivers now. And uh, I'm not sure how much, how long this segment's going to go. We're going to try to keep it so Otherwise light. known as the Evan Lazar segment. <laughs> <laughs> right. Evan, right. go easy on these guys. No, but we've been, look, we've, we've been talking, and, and we were saying before, like we've talked Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, um, those kind of top yes, three. Yes, yes, yes. yes we yes. like them all. Uh, there's plenty of analysis out there. I mean, we can touch briefly upon those guys. But really, it's more about more realistic options for the Patriots. Of course, like they could go sideways and take Harrison or neighbors at the top. We don't really think that's going to happen, but you know, I'll, I'll tee you up first, Evan, though, as we get down, you know, into that, like late first round, early second round, that's where the Patriots maybe are going to be picking or they could trade up. Who do you see those guys in there? I know AD Mitchell's probably the top of the list. Yeah. AD Mitchell and both Texas guys, AD Mitchell, Xavier worthy, both guys I think are really good. Uh, going to be good pros. I, I have, my tiers are published on on patriots.com for these receivers. I have 20 guys that I that I think are going to be top 100 picks in this class. Maybe at some point towards the end here I'll just rattle all of them off so you we can say, <laughs> "Well, you didn't talk about this guy." Well, we did. I said to go to minute 6 with second 4 like there was. So, I'll I'll tee, I'll tee tease up for this because we were just talking about this off the air. The one guy that rose up for me more than any other player in this class from when I started doing this in January to now is Xavier Leggett from South Carolina. When I watched him initially, I got a lot of LaVisca Chenault vibes it, down at the Senior Bowl also. Just stiff, you know, big, you know, 221-pound guy, some vertical speed, some scheme touch ability, but not really a great route runner. But the more that you watch him, you see some other guys that he could – develop into that are a much better comp than LaVisca Chenault but I know you have uh, a comp I had I, I don't know if I'll get killed for this I had a faster Anquan Bolden <laughs> all right he, he okay he, no I'm serious <laughs> he's built he's got hands he can he can play deep play across the middle very dangerous can run after the catch that's kind of like the guy the Patriots need and this could be a second round steal and that's like that sweet spot of where you want to get a guy you hope he's a day one starter or at least gets a lot of playing time in his first year so that's who I have so the only thing I would say about that is that Anquan Bolden was an awesome route runner yeah really quick feet really good he was route also run. much faster when he came out of school than what people remember yeah like the Arizona Anquan Bolden was electric mm -hmm. yeah. I think he had 250 yards in his first ever game yeah. Um, and then he sort of became kind of plotting. The crafty guy. Yeah. Yeah. Can, yeah. can take the hits, Baltimore. good hands, reliable. I yeah. Think that's, that's so my, I think my comp this whole time for Leggett's been Debo. I, I just think that he's one of those guys that probably isn't going to have a traditional NFL route tree. But if you just find different ways to get him the ball in his hands and let him run with it, whether it's quick hitters over the middle, scheme touches, vertical routes, whatever, uh, he'll be able to do those types of things. But I don't think that he's going to be one of those guys that's going to have a ton of branches. Where so, so I would applaud that because I think there's a sim similarity between the two different guys that you chose. Um, obviously, Debo, too, with the South Carolina connection. That might be part of I it. I like him. I like Leggett. Um and I'm going to trust Evan here. I'm going to put my trust in Evan about the route running because I kind of saw a guy that kind of 
looked like he was rounding things off a little bit, but I'll trust that you watched a lot more than I did. <laughs> um, yeah, be an interesting guy, interesting yeah. prospect. No, and I, I know he did yeah. well, um, you know, testing and all that. Yeah, no, I don't like his route running, just oh, to be okay. clear. Okay. Yeah, I, I, don't, I thought he was kind of rounded some stuff yeah, off. Yeah, no, no, I he's, not, okay, he's not a route runner to I feel me. better about it now. That's why I compared him to Debo, because I think – he if he's in the right role and he's yeah. used correctly he's such a game breaker before and after the catch with his speed and there's only so many guys that at 221 pounds run a 439 like that doesn't just grow on trees so i really like him but i love i also really like the technicians in this class i think all of them are really really good uh options on day two uh lad mcconkey i was gonna say Ro- say it roman <laughs> lad mcconkey roman wilson ricky pearsall the two Washington kids, Polk, McMillan, yeah. all those guys run routes. They all have PhDs in route running. Uh, they're all awesome at the top of the route. They all you know, have all that technical savvy that you want. I really like McMillan a little bit later. If you're looking for like 68, you know, down the line here. Uh, I comped him to like a more explosive Jacoby Myers, you know, Jacoby Myers, but with a four, four, seven, like that type of player. So you, you didn't mention Troy Franklin, where your thoughts on him. So Troy Franklin, I liked initially, uh, his combine was rough and he ran a four, four, one, which is good speed, but it's not elite, elite speed. Uh, my comp for him has been Jerry Judy. I just think that he's got, much better route running skill than people give him credit for, but play strength and being able to uh, to finish through contact is going to be a concern. I think that there's a chance that he's got Jerry Judy like drop issues at the next level because of that. So uh, that's why I think he's going to be able to separate. I don't think that's going to be an issue for him. Uh, it's going to be finishing the catches. That's going to be more of the problem. Yeah. Who else you got, Paul? Anybody well, I just want to know if Evan could give us a summation of Keon Coleman, <laughs> his favorite. Thumbs down. So here's the thing about Keon <laughs> Coleman. Uh, Keon Coleman has a lot of red flags. And then there's also a a very, very high ceiling if he does reach the potential. He doesn't separate. He doesn't run well. His contested catch ability is supposed to be his calling card. He only caught 33% of his contested targets last year. For comparison, Roma Duesde caught 75% of his contested targets. That's a mouthful. Can't say that. (laughs) Uh, So... You're telling me that this is like a jump ball artist who doesn't even really catch jump balls all that well. So what's the upside to Keon Coleman is that he plays a lot faster than what he timed in the 40-yard dash. So this is a guy that if you like the in-game tra- tracking data, you know, the the GPS stuff, he's going to run 20-plus miles an hour at 6'3", 225, and that's going to attract people to him. So I think at best – He's like maybe like an Allen Robinson type, you know, that like wins with that size and that ability to uh, pick up yards after the catch and, you know, contested grabs, things like that. At worst, I, I see a lot of Nikhil Harry. I do like I see a lot of the same type of vibes as Nikhil Harry where he's, you know, just a plotter. Like he's just not particularly yeah, I, fast. I saw him, you know, a couple of times watching Florida State games and I was not overly impressed with anything but his size, his sheer size. Um so I kind of agree. A couple of late guys, and I'm surprised, you know, Mr. Bloodlines, you let Rice go, huh? Yeah, I, just, I, have other, Rice? Yeah. I just have other guys. Uh, yeah. I just think in, in terms of the the whole double dip, right? Yep. We talk about the Patriots are going to try to get somebody maybe in the second round, um, you know, or, th- or the third round, and then maybe you you double dip. So I think, you know, Jermaine Burton is I had him too. pretty inconsistent. Um, you know, the, the production's not, I, I don't think, where you would think. For a program like Alabama, but you know, these I think the second of two, I wouldn't be too upset about. You know, maybe yeah. rolling the dice. You know, yeah. Brendan Rice being love the other one. J- Jermaine yeah. Burton. I think yeah. Jermaine Burton. Oh. If good job, Paul. Yeah. If uh, Jermaine Burton wasn't a head case, yeah, there's something, then, there's something going yeah. on. Then he might be a top fifty pick in this draft just simply based off of talent. Uh, he's a very good vertical threat. I comped him to Darius Slayton with the Giants. Like he has that explosive down the field ability, uh, but he's got a thicker frame. So he's not like Troy Franklin, who's like a little bit frailer. So he's got a lot going for him uh, physically and just in terms of the profile. Uh, but he, he has some off field stuff. I, I really had good. Ricky purse. All we talked about earlier, love him Unreal hands, which is key. I just don't know if he's the receiver. The Patriots need right now. He's more of a slot guy. Yeah. Um, but then also had Tez Walker. We mentioned him in a couple episodes. I just don't think there's any downside to bringing him in with a potential quarterback. He's familiar with. So yeah, I was kind of, I, 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 I don't love him. Tez. Yeah. I didn't really like him at first either. And I think the only reason I've kind of like opened up to him is just purely his speed and his connection with Drake may, if Drake may were to be here, um, but but two other names I feel like we got to 
mentioned, Malachi Corley um, oh, good one, and Mike. Javon Baker, two guys that Baker I've kind of come on to lately, but not the fastest guy, but inside, outside. And, you know, you said it, Tease, as like someone like Brendan Rice, like has some outside potential. And I think when you're getting down, Patriots have a lot of interior receivers right now. And as you get later into these picks, like who can play on the outside? Who can get off press? Who's got speed enough to, to draw some coverage with him? So uh, I don't know if those two guys are. And Baker has some inside-outside flexibility. But, you know, Corley is, again, kind of a poor man's. These are the guys I'm kind of drawn to. LaVisca Chenault, you know, you're, you got those Debo vibes a little bit. because, you, know, you know, you and I were the only two LaVisca Chenault fans there were. <laughs> LaVisca Chenault we is, is my comp for Corley. Yeah. Because uh, Corley, his average air yards per target was 5.5 yards. Oh, he's like this is, the this is a, a guy right? that yeah. caught like a million screens, <laughs> yep. a million yeah. slants, a million crossing routes, you know, over the middle of the field. And he's a running back, you know, with yeah. the football in his hands. So just let him run with it. I like the Baker shout. A good, good player. I think, you know, Alabama transfer goes to UCF for more opportunities. He's a good player. Um, there's one other guy. Oh, Johnny Wilson from Florida State is the uh, is the last guy that in my top 20 that I don't think that we mentioned by name other than, you know, BTJ and some of the other guys that are going to go at the top of the draft. Uh, but Johnny Wilson is an interesting player, uh, 6'6", 230, monster, mm. uh, but runs routes. You know, can run routes pretty well. He's not uh, he's not stiff. He's not, you know, Kelvin Benjamin. You know, this is a guy that can get in and out of a break and, and run some routes and do some different things. So uh, this is a – that this is one of the best receiver classes we're ever going to see. It, it's it's honestly that good. It's top heavy. It's de- it's deep. Like there's going to be a Puka Nakua in this class. I'm sure that's going to get taken in the fourth or fifth round. That ends up being a stud too. Uh, it's an impressive class. We well, can just tell by how much we're talking about. Anybody there? Anybody else? Paul, we, we didn't mention Tease. Anybody? No. We did. Oh, I mean, I good. feel like we covered so much, and that you know speaks to your point, Evan, of how deep of a class this is. It's a huge need for the Patriots. Paul and I have been going crazy for about five years now that they haven't hit on one of these guys. It's time. They need to at least take one of them, maybe do the double dip, as Paul said. So plenty there to digest there at the weapons positions. All big needs. You can find him on Bleacher Report and Reception Perception with his QB charting. He's Derek Class and Derek, been a big fan for a long time. Excited to talk to you about these quarterbacks today. How are you doing? Uh, first of all, I appreciate that. And second of all, I'm doing great. Doing doing good. It feels uh feels like we're kind of really getting into that like real end push of the draft season. So it feels good. Yeah, right. Uh, the hay is almost in the barn, as we we say around here with the draft. And I've been uh, reading your your charting on quarterbacks. Uh, probably since, uh, I don't know, 19, 20, something like that. So those are great resources, and you guys should go check them out. So we're going to talk to Derek, of course, about those quarterbacks, a big area of need for the Patriots. I don't know if you knew that, Derek, but you know the Patriots might take a quarterback. It's a little topic around here every once in a while. So let's start at the top, and uh, I want to start with Drake May because uh, I have an affinity for Drake May. I've fallen in love with him during this process, and it's always great to, to see – uh, somebody like yourself also see a lot of the same things that I do and, and why I think he's such a great prospect uh, for the Patriots in particular. Uh, so what do you see in Drake May? And do you buy into some people, you know, I'll name names, Chris Sims, you know, has him as QB six, you know, he's kind of all over the place um, with all these rankings, but where are, do you fall on Drake May? I, I think he's fantastic. Like, I think he's a truly unbelievable prospect. Like we've done this whole thing with Caleb being like a, you know, one of the best prospects of a generation. And I think he absolutely is. I mean, we're probably not going to talk about him a whole lot here because there's no shot the Patriots get him. But yeah. I think May is like in that same tier of, of player. I even like to, to me, May is the one a um, I will say part of that is just like my personal affinity for certain traits of quarterback. Like I think, I mean, May is just obviously much bigger. I think um, some of what he can do as a design runner, I think is a little bit more valuable than Caleb. And then to me, what really, really puts Drake may over the top. I mean, there's a lot of reasons and I'm, I'm, we'll touch on all of them, but to me, it's just the way that I think he handles the pocket and is able to throw with bodies around him is like really, really special. I think it's the type of stuff you see from a lot of the best quarterbacks in the in the NFL already, whether it's Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, um, even Dak Prescott, I think has this quality when he's throwing around bodies in, in, in the pocket and stuff. I think may, has that to him and then when you combine that just on top of like the raw arm talent that he has where he's just able to put the ball in in places that seem almost impossible for a quarterback and I know people are going to harp on him for like the consistency and I do think he has a couple of sprays a game but I think what you get out of him on most plays and especially on his best plays it's what you chase when you're looking for 
a, a potential top five, top six type of quarterback. And I think Drake may has all that stuff. And I think what people need to remember too, is like Drake may is still a very young player. He's the youngest quarterback. Um, I think in this class, um, I, JJ might be a little bit younger, but he's still like one of the, he's a very, very young player. Um, and I think for him to be as good as he is with even some of the flaws that people have, like, Oh, his footwork isn't perfect. He has two sprays a game. He has like one completely dog brained play like Josh Allen, every game that that seems like the dumbest thing you've ever seen. But I think so much of that stuff is fixable, especially when you just look at the raw talent that he has. And so much of the just gamer that he plays with, like, I just, I could gush about him forever. I, I truly think he's a really, really special prospect. I, I love that. And I think that's the original thing that drew me to him is what you mentioned. And coming off the, the Mac Jones experience for Patriots fans, I think the biggest thing is, is that you have to have a baseline level of arm talent and being able to drive the football down the field in those muddied pockets. I think with Mac when he had a clean pocket to step up into and, and really put his weight behind a throw, he had the NFL caliber arm uh, to get the ball where it needed to go. But as things started to fall apart around him, I think what we noticed here in New England is that now all of a sudden he's throwing off his back foot or he's throwing from muddied pockets and he's not able to step into it and he wasn't able to generate that velocity that he needed. I remember there was one throw I watched early on where Drake Mays backed up on his own end zone and he kind of pumps to the middle of the field uh, to hold the uh, the hook defender and then hits the crossing route basically flat-footed coming the, across the field the other way and I was like there's no offense to Mac but there's just no way that he could make that throw and I think that that's <laughs> what we're looking for as Pats fans now is that raw talent and ability that Josh Allen type of quarterback and that's why so many of us have fallen for Drake May L- one last question on Drake May I feel like I know where you're, you're gonna, your head is going to be at with this, but a lot of people, credible people, have said that he needs to sit, that he needs to be sat for a year, maybe the, maybe the Jordan Love track, or you know, even just Patrick Mahomes sit his rookie season and then play year two. Where do you fall on that line, and do you think that he's so raw that he has to sit behind a veteran quarterback? Uh, My take, honestly, with almost every prospect is that they would probably benefit from sitting like the I even think Caleb like would benefit from a year like I that's just generally a thing I believe. The reality is that most guys just aren't (laughs) like it's teams want to go play guys and they they want to see their investment on the field um, immediately. But I think like within that context of thinking that most guys are just going to play anyway, I think may is totally fine being in that bucket because I think we what we've seen a lot of the times is that the guys who don't sink and are able to swim as, as rookies, even if they're not, you know, like may, like I said, his footwork is not perfect. He is probably going to have to learn a little bit of how NFL offenses work coming from two different styles of air raid offenses at, at North Carolina. Like there are going to be growing pains, but I just think he's so unbelievably talented. He's so athletic. He's so just like raw and brave in the pocket. And that type of stuff, I think is stuff that you can see translate and, and get productive play out of, even if he's not perfect. I mean, I think even just last year, we saw this from Anthony Richardson, right? Like yeah. Anthony Richardson, is he the most accurate quarterback right now? No, like he could probably clean up his footwork a little bit. Is he the fastest processor in the league right now? Like, no, he, he came from an offense that didn't ask him to do as much as an NFL offense is going to. And I think it's going to take him a little bit. It's going to take him a year or two to like really ramp up into that. But we still saw him be a very productive and like, very impressive quarterback in the few games that he was able to play in part because it's the arm talent that we, that that we both mentioned where like he just has the raw ability to make certain throws, even if maybe he's late, maybe his feet are off. Like he still can make certain throws. And I think that that's really valuable. And then he has um, pocket toughness, which I think is always going to translate immediately. Um, Especially, I mean, it's not even just that he has pocket toughness. It's that he was very battle hardened behind a terrible North Carolina offensive line. Like he's had a lot of reps where he's had to be the guy under pressure. And I think that's going to actually help when he, when he goes into the NFL, Um, and then he just has like that creative, I'm going to be Superman. I'm going to go make a play. And I think when you're just a rookie thrown into the fire, you have to have that. You have to have that mentality. And then also the ability to go capitalize on it. I think may checks both boxes. So yeah, he probably would benefit from getting a year to, to clean up his footwork and learn NFL offenses, but like he's, he's going to be just fine. I think if he has to play right away. Yeah, I agree. We could gush about Drake may for probably another 30 minutes. So let's move on oh, to yeah. to the next couple <laughs> quarterbacks here. Uh, you, you didn't, you mentioned JJ McCarthy, but I want to get to Jaden Daniels first before we get to McCarthy. Uh, Jaden Daniels, I, I feel like is one of those guys uh, that when I first watched him, I was like, this guy's electric. 
electric. He can do a million different things. I think he's a much better passer uh, than you know those prototypical uh, guys coming out that are pure runners like he is. Uh, but where do you fall with Jaden Daniels? It does sound like the commanders might be locking in on him at number two. But uh, if he's there for the Patriots at three overall, what's your take on on Jaden? Uh, I. I think he's a fine prospect. I, th- I think I'm a lot lower on him than, than most people. Um, to your point though, like when you first watch him, um, whether it's on Sundays or just your first exposure to him or on Saturdays or just your first exposure to him on film, there's a lot of stuff to like, like, I think he is a very accurate passer to basically every level of the field on the throws that he does make. I think he throws, um, short and outside the numbers really well. I think he throws down the field really well. Um, even though he didn't throw the middle of the field a lot, which is a concern I'll bring up in a little bit. Um, he did throw it well when he actually triggered on it. And I think that at least the ability to do it um, is a nice thing in his bag. He's obviously an unbelievable athlete. I mean, he's going to step in and be one of the five best yeah. uh, probably rushing threats in the NFL immediately. Um, and that's, I think, going to going to be a really nice boost to whatever offense he takes. You know, whatever you get out of him as a passer year one, you're going to have that floor with him as a runner, which I think is super valuable. He's the guy who... I think he progresses through concepts fairly well. And like, he doesn't make glaring mistakes. It's just, sometimes he won't trigger and be aggressive, which leads to like, okay, sometimes he leaves yards on the field, but also he never really puts the ball at risk. So it's a little bit of like, which do you want out of your quarterback? If that makes sense. Um, me personally, why I'm a little bit lower on him is like, I want the guy who's just going to blindly rip a dig route. <laughs> like yeah. I just, that's, that's why I love Drake may he'll, he'll just do it. Um, Jaden is a little bit less willing to do that. He's a little bit more in the, probably not as bad as Russell Wilson, but it's like in that Russell Wilson, Jalen hurts ish, where it's like, this is probably just never going to be his area of the field. Um, and then the other thing with Jaden that I think has turned me off from him a little bit is I don't think he manages the pocket very well. And I don't think he makes plays. um, I don't think he makes throws off script very consistently or very well. And he's not very willing to do it. Like he's the guy where, okay, one to two to three in in a clean pocket, he's going to make a good throw for sure. There's no doubt about that. I think when he gets pressured and gets moved off his spot a little bit, he is very quick to like, okay, the play's dead. I'm running. And that's, that's great at the college level. I think in the NFL, it's really, really hard to get away with being that way. I think, the best NFL quarterbacks are guys who, okay, initial plays dead. I'm going to get outside the pocket and look to throw first. I think you even see this from like people who are comparing him to Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson is very much like outside the pocket. Eyes are up. He's looking to throw He'll run if he has to, but he's very much a guy who's looking to, to make throws outside of the pocket with Jaden. I just don't see that as much. And I think that's a really hard thing to get a guy to do. So that's kind of some of my concerns. I, I like I said, I think there is a lot to like, I'm just a little bit more hesitant on or a little bit more weary of what his ceiling is, I think, than some other people. Yeah, I, I think you brought up a lot of really good points. The, the thing that stood out to me is that there's this play against Florida where he's got Malik neighbors jumping up and down in the middle of the field, asking him to throw him the ball. And he passes it up wide open, dig route in the middle of the field. And he ends up running for 50 yards on the play. He just takes off scrambling and he runs. And on the one hand, it's like, wow, that running ability is dynamic. That's difference making. But on the other hand, on, in the NFL, you'd probably rather him take the dig route, right? And, and let the playmakers do the work instead of having uh, him have to do everything himself. So that was one of those plays that I felt like was the perfect encapsulation of the yin and the yang with Jaden Daniels, where he's going to pass up some things in the middle of the field that other quarterbacks or uh, guys in the league will trigger on, like you said. But then he's also going to be able to have that tantalizing running ability. So it's like, you know, how, how do you pick on him too much for it uh, when he just broke off a 45-yard scramble? Uh, but I, I think that that, uh, in, coupled with the fact that he does have the smaller frame and the durability concerns. If he's always looking to run, then is he going to last, you know, and is it going to, is it going to be able to be consistent and sustainable at the next level or are legitimate concerns? The other concern I wanted to ask you about, I know I always do this. It always sounds like I'm, I'm trashing on Jaden uh, when I'm like not really trying to, it's just, I, I think that there are some concerns there with him. The other thing that I, I think was a little bit concerning to me as well is that so much of his production came off those slot fade routes, throwing to neighbors and to, Brian Thomas Jr. And where are his layups in an NFL offense? And where's the easy yards for him, especially if he comes to a place like New England, where he might not have those 
outside winners. You know, he might not get step into an offense right away with the Patriots where he has two you know, premium elite receivers at, on the outside to make those plays. Uh, do you think that he can be a guy that survives without the supporting cast, I guess is the best way to look at it. I, I would be a little bit concerned. And I think that's a great point because even in, in like my charting that I did for him, a lot of his production, like you said, is either the slot fades that they ran or just standard go balls, or he threw a lot of like hitches and curls outside the numbers. And to your point, it was a lot of like, okay, I've just got two top 15 picks on the outside. I'm going to go give him a shot. And like I said, he's great at doing that. But when you, no matter what team he goes to, he's going to have like a rel on a relative level, less talent outside than he had at LSU. And so you're going to have to calibrate for that. And so when you couple that with some of the concerns I have with him throwing the middle of the field, it's like, ah, this gets a little bit sticky. And then with me, the other concern with Daniels is I think he's actually even more so than receiver. I think a guy who absolutely needs a rock solid offensive line, just because of some of the, you know, pocket management and like quick to run, type of tendencies that I see from him. I think, I mean, obviously nobody is going to replicate the, the Eagles offensive line, but like he needs to be in a Jalen hurts esque um, like incubator where that you can kind of almost nullify that part of like that issue of his game. And I think, especially if he goes to Washington, that's going to be a problem because their offensive line is terrible. Um, and then I think even in new England, it would probably be an issue because their offensive line is a little bit better than Washington's, but I think also still, still very much an issue yeah yeah it's it's a good point and uh you know that's why i've gravitated towards drake may throughout this process is i just feel like for the patriots it just makes more sense it fits together a little bit better but i'm glad you brought up the things about Jaden daniels as a processor because i do think he is much better uh getting through progressions than some people would think at it that type of quarterback and I, I also think that uh, you know even though he doesn't have the biggest of arms uh, the throwing motion and the mechanics of his throwing are really really clean uh, maybe even cleaner than Lamar coming out in some ways and just in terms of the footwork and the mechanics of his release and things like that but uh, let's uh, wrap this up uh, with two quick questions one uh, on JJ McCarthy uh, we could probably go long on this one as well so feel free to, to go as long as you want but uh, JJ McCarthy I think this has been the most frustrating aspect. I'm not going to lie to you, Derek, about this uh, com this uh, process, this draft process, is that he's just, without playing a football game, has all of a sudden come out of nowhere and, and is you know a top five quarterback prospect that we have to take seriously at three overall. But that being said, I am taking it seriously. Do you take it seriously? Because at this point, there's too much smoke for me to just completely dismiss that J.J. McCarthy's in this conversation. Yeah, I, I do take it seriously. And I personally am not that high on him as a prospect, but I would be stunned if he falls any further than like the Giants at six. Yeah. Like, I think there's almost no world where he uh, gets past that because I do think all of the, you know, smoke about him going that high isn't smoke. Like, that's, I think it's very, very real. I think teams really do like him um, in that mold. And I think a big part of the, the reason is, I mean, you get a lot of like, okay, you know, big school won a lot. That's good. That's always going to help. But I think a lot of it too is, He's a very young player who was in a general sense, like kind of untested um, just between the competition that he was playing on relative or against relative to how good his team was. And then just some of the things that the offense asked him to do, like they run a pro style offense in the sense that they like go under center and they'll run play action and he gets to check plays every now and then. But in terms of the throws that they're actually asking him to make and the stuff they're actually asking him to do in terms of post snap processing is not that much more impressive than like what Jaden Daniels was asked to do or Caleb or Drake may like, it really isn't that different, even though the presentation looks a little bit more NFL, like, like they did a lot of, um, they would just do that, like return motion where uh, X receiver comes back into the formation, goes back out and they throw the flat route. And it's like the easiest read in the world. And he probably got a thousand yards just throwing that route. Um, so I, I think because of all that relative untestedness, and then you look at the arm strength that he has, the athleticism, um, again, some of the winning, you can just be like, it's, he's a mystery box. You can see whatever you want because there's such a relatively small sample of things. And then you just get to project the tools into being whatever you want. I've been a little bit more cautious with it in, in terms of like how I project it, but I do understand why some teams are like, you know, you could project these tools with, you know, three years of development into being 
you know, what Jordan Love has become or, or something of that of that nature. Yeah, that's a good comp. I, I think the biggest things with me with JJ is, first of all, there's still some of those WTF plays on his film po- where he's just throwing the ball in the team midi- meetings and stuff. Like, I can't get the Maryland game out of my head either where, you know, he's back-to-back oh turnover-worthy plays in the red zone or uh, the very, very first play from scrimmage against Alabama in the playoff where he just throws a terrible inter- – I don't think it counted. I think the guy was out of bounds or something, but it's still – it still counts in my book, right? Uh, you know, and PFFs turnover worthy plays, those still count. So you look at those types of plays, those are, are concerning. The other thing uh, is that he has that wide elongated base that he throws from to really drive the ball down the field. And I wonder, you know, going back to the Mac Jones thing that we were talking about with Drake May, when those pockets are more condensed and there's more bodies around him, there's more people flying around is the arm strength going to be as impressive as what it seems to be from those Michigan pockets? Like, I feel like we had to adjust with Mac to Alabama pockets. Like these are Michigan pockets that he's throwing from uh, last year. So where do you kind of grade his physical tools? Cause I feel like I'm a little bit lower on like his arm talent and, and his, even his mobility at, at times than other people where other people talk about him on the same plane as Drake may when, when it comes to those types of traits. Uh, as it, as it pertains to Drake may. Yeah. I don't think he's close to as talented as Drake may like, um, and that is not even really to take away from JJ. That again, is just like how much I think Drake may is super talented. Uh, my comparison for McCarthy's arm has actually been Baker. Yeah. Um, where Baker can like, he can put RPMs on the ball, dude. Like he can spin it, especially over the middle of the field. It's just that Baker and, uh, JJ are very much throwers where it kind of takes everything in their body to get all of that velocity and it's like, okay, that's cool. That gets them to where they need to be for the NFL threshold and all that stuff. It gets them over it, but because they're sacrificing, like, you know, putting all of this effort into the velocity, they kind of lose a little bit of control. And I think you especially see that with McCarthy when he's either throwing outside the numbers where you need like a little bit of air under the ball, get some, get some arc on it when he's throwing like corner routes, um, some of the deep outs, all that sort of stuff. And then every now and then you can see it on like the crossing routes, like the deep overs they would throw in the offense where maybe it's trail man coverage and you can't just pin it on a guy. You've got to like put a little air under it, let your guy, you know, put the ball over the defender. I think sometimes he can struggle to do that. So I do agree in the sense of like, physical talent he's more of like a b b plus than like in the a plus range like drake and caleb and all that stuff and then athletically probably not ever going to really be a guy that is a serious run threat for you it it could be like you know where one or two times a game you you run a zone read on you know fourth and one or whatever i think he could probably do that but generally i think he's more just a guy who gives you enough enough athletic ability to get outside the pocket and make plays but he's not going to be one of those guys who is like a serious serious rushing threat every week the way that you know Jaden or drake or caleb are gonna be yeah i agree all right last one for you in terms of the rest of the quarterback class i feel like that's the best way to put it uh who is your favorite out of the next tier of Penix, uh nicks maybe even spencer rattler do you have a favorite out of that group i go back and forth between nicks and rattler um, because they're just two completely different flavors. Like I, I grade them. I have the same exact grade on them for, for Bleacher Report. It's just that one, uh, Nick's Nick's is more of like, I know what I'm getting here. Yeah. I know I'm getting a guy who, um, pretty accurate to almost all levels of the field, um, has enough arm strength, even though it doesn't really wow you. I think he's a good enough athlete to actually be more of a designed runner than even like JJ, who we just mentioned. I think he can be in the Daniel Jones, you know, get 500 yards out of this um, type of runner. I think he's a guy who generally doesn't make mistakes, gets the ball out of his hands cleanly. Um, He can do all the RPO, you know, quick game stuff. To me, he's more like in the, I think if Bo Nix becomes like Andy Dalton, that would not really be a a surprise to me. And I'd I'd really have a hard time seeing him be like terrible. So I I think in the, if you just want a guy who, you know what you're going to get, Nix is totally fine. I think if you want the flash rattler is the guy uh, rattler is just like, well, I, I think I said something like this on Twitter, but like to me, the two guiding principles for like a really, really good quarterback prospect are arm talent and pocket management. Rattler's got it, man. Like arm talent. I mean, I don't even need to really talk about that. Like, I think we've all seen Spencer Rattler throw a football, but the pocket management stuff really impressed me when I went back and charted him because that South Carolina offensive line, if you guys haven't seen it very bad, like it's, it's terrible. I don't know what, uh, what was going on there. I think someone tweeted a thing where like, I think in like 10 of 12 games, they had a different starting five. 
up front, yes. which is just, that's not how you want to operate in the SEC. Especially in college, <laughs> um, you don't see that very often, yeah. Uh, right. And, and so I think for him to to have to deal with that was just really tough. And it obviously led to some just terrible plays because when you're behind on the scoreboard and you're under that kind of pressure, you're just naturally going to make bad plays. But I think you also saw a lot of really, really good ability for him to move around the pocket, keep his eyes up, keep a firm base, throw from some really weird and tight uh, platforms. Like we were just talking about with like, you know, JJ and Jaden, that might be an issue. But with Rattler, I don't think that's a problem at all. I think he can make any throw from any platform, no matter how crowded it is. So I, I think there's definitely some consistency issues you're, you're going to have with Rattler in terms of accuracy, in terms of maybe some of his scattered decision making. But man, if you can get him into, I think, a little bit more stable situation than he had, the raw talent is just, I think, leaps and bounds better than any of the non top four guys. I love it. I love it. He's Derek Klassen from Bleacher Report and Reception Perception. Go give him a look on Twitter as well, at QB Class. And Derek, I really appreciate you doing this. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. This was great. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of Patriots Draft Countdown. Only two more shows left. We're going to wrap things up with a live show there on April 24th. Full hour-long edition. I don't know. Maybe we'll have some more news by then, but certainly a lot of build-up here to the 2024 draft. It's a hugely important one for the Patriots, so just two more weeks, two more episodes to go. We'll see you next time.